The UN estimates that there are around 300,000 people trapped with dwindling food and medical supplies in rebel-held areas of Aleppo in Syria, which have been laid siege to by forces loyal to the Assad government. With no way in or out, Russia said last week that it had opened four humanitarian corridors to allow people to leave. But their safety has been called into doubt by many living in the city who do not trust that they will be kept safe even if they do leave. Dr David Knott is one of the UK's leading British surgeons and has worked in Syria. He says he fears the worst for the last remaining doctors in Aleppo after he lost contact with medics who he'd been in contact with regularly following the bombing over a number of, of a number of hospitals over the weekend. I spoke to him a little earlier. I'm in contact with uh, people most days, really, um, but I haven't heard from my colleagues in Syria and Aleppo uh, for about a week now. Um, I can't get through to their phones. Their phones are down. So the only uh, contacts I've had are through the OSM, which is the Union of Syrian Medical Charities. And they've come back to me yesterday, and I, I spoke to the chairman, and he told me that uh, I tried to say you know, I can't get through to anybody. And he said, well, in fact, nine hospitals were targeted uh, last week alone, and that the hospital I was trying to contact um, was, was uh, attacked yesterday. It's an underground hospital in the centre of Aleppo where I worked in 2013 and 2014. And there's a possibility that there was a high explosive attack directed onto that yesterday. And he said to me that the information they've got is that 70% of the hospital has been uh, damaged and also 70% of the people in there have been either killed or injured. So th that's the information I'm getting constantly all the time. And I've, I'm usually in contact with four or five doctors every week, twice a week, three times a week, and we discuss cases, we discuss their management of cases. And I've not been able to hear from any of them at all. As you said, you have worked in these places. Mm. Describe them for us, the sort of resources they have, what it's like, what the, what the setup well, I was is. There in, I was in Aleppo for six weeks in 2013, and it was when there was probably around half, one and a half million people within the city, and there was a full-blown war going on at the time. But we had resources, we had access to roads, we had access to uh, 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 lots of... Um, uh, medical equipment and, and everything else. So there wasn't a huge amount of needs required at that time. There was lots of casualties, but we were able to cope with them all. There were lots of beds, lots of ITU beds and so on and so forth. But 2014 was completely different because the city was being barrel bombed and targeted by airstrikes constantly. And uh, so to the extent that when we were dealing with patients, we were dealing with terrible wounds, terrible fragmentation wounds and people dying of dust inhalation and so on. So it was really difficult. And although the number of hospitals were still going at that time, it didn't appear to me that there was anything too bad uh, because we were still able to function. A lot of the hospitals had been targeted with barrel bombs, and so they, they, they made them underground hospitals. So we were working in two underground hospitals at the time. Um, and th those are the facilities at the time. We had intensive care unit beds um, to put our patients into that were se severely injured, and we had people that were able to look after them as well. But the situation now is really intolerable and really unacceptable because uh, yesterday I heard that they there are... There's only 13 intensive care unit beds for the whole of Aleppo. And that means if the hospital yesterday was targeted, it's probably down to seven, and seven for 300,000 people. And the problem is as well is that if the road is closed out of Aleppo, the Castello Road, um, nobody can come in and come out. So they can't, usually we used to transport patients off to Turkey, but we now can't transport them either. Uh, you have said several times about hospitals being targeted. Do you believe they are being deliberately targeted and that doctors are being deliberately targeted? Absolutely. No, uh, I've said it so many times, and um, I've tried to fly the flag that this is happening. And in fact, we, we ran a march in, in London, in Trafalgar Square, about, about 250 of us walked down to give a letter in to the Prime Minister to say that the hospitals are directly being targeted. And it's something which is against international humanitarian law, it's against the Geneva Conventions. But it's quite interesting that in 2012, the Assad regime actually passed a, a law to say that it was legitimate to target hospitals, to target doctors, to target civilians, in fact, to target anybody that wasn't involved positively with the regime side. So they've made it legal 
to actually bomb hospitals. And I know for a fact that these hospitals are being targeted. Why would they do that? Because if you take out a doctor, if you take out a healthcare worker, you really take out the facilities to help you know, five or 10,000 people. So where are those people going to go? Their lives are going to go more miserable. They're going to think that there's nobody there to help them. It's just a psychological on top of you know, medical warfare, basically. In 2013, you called for humanitarian corridors. It is being done now, but it doesn't seem people are using them. What do you think is going on? Well, that's not true, actually, because I called for humanitarian corridors in 2013 to allow aid in and allow people out and backwards and forwards. But the humanitarian corridors that have been suggested by the Syrian regime is only to let people out. It's not to let aid in at all. So it's not a humanitarian corridor. It's a corridor of pretense, that I've been saying. And why do you think people aren't actually taking the opportunity to leave? Because those people have been there for three, for five years, and the 300,000 people that have been there for five years, they're not going to want to suddenly decide, OK, well, I, I, I trust the regime now. I'm going to go and live in a refugee camp because they've been watching the television. They know what's been going on. They know how devastating it is to try and cross the Mediterranean. They see what's happening. They don't want to leave their homes. They don't want to leave their families. They're happy just to stick it out, and they will not leave. I can tell you now that the over the weekend, I think there are two dozen people that left by this humanitarian corridor. The rest of the people will stay, and they will stay. And the problem is, is if they do stay, it's going, they're going to be starved. They, nobody's being, going to be allowed to get any aid in or any provisions in or any medical aid at all. And we're going to sit there watching our televisions every day, drinking our coffee, watching the news, watching these people desperately suffering. And the real problem is, is that I have had so much links with Aleppo. I know so. I know the city very well. I know. I know the people very well. They're lovely people. They're they're just civilians like you and me. But they they have been terribly, terribly harmed. Harmed by lack of aid from the western side, for example. They've been expecting people. And in fact, in fact, the British people have done wonderfully fantastic because they've uh, through Syria Relief and through the Syrian uh, NGOs they've donated millions and millions of pounds to help Syrian refugees uh, Syrian people in Aleppo and the problem is like people like for example myself and other doctors that have been there training the doctors to to try and help their people which we've done and it's that's not been in vain but the problem is is that now if 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 I understand from yesterday that somebody, one of the chairmen told me that perhaps there was only three surgeons left uh, in Aleppo, and, and you know it seems a travesty of justice that we can just sit by and watch this happening. So what should be done? Well, I think you know there's always I've always called for things in 2013. I called for you know humanitarian corridors to be set up, and they said it was that's not going to happen, David. But I, I can understand that you know boots on the ground perhaps is not the right thing to do, but there should be really high-level negotiations now between um, between the pri our pri new Prime Minister should say, OK, we can't sit here and watch our televisions and watch this happening. There should be negotiations perhaps with the Foreign Minister, from the British Foreign Minister, the American Foreign Minister. They should go to President Putin. They should try the highest, the highest possible uh, um, governmental attack to try and and change what's happening, and just to show that you know, we can't sit by and, and let this happen. Not not let this happen now. I mean, we we said in two thousand in nineteen ninety four when Rwanda was happening, we we will never let this happen again. We said when, when we saw Srebrenica, we said that should never happen again. But it's happening, and it's happening in front of our eyes. And I just feel that you know, I myself and people like myself go on the radio and television. And I cannot understand why there is no action from, from the government. I cannot understand. You've been to all sorts of war zones, many war zones over the years. How does this situation um, compare, if you can look at it in that way, with, with what, what you've seen before and experienced before? Well, I think, you know, I've been to many war zones and I dip in and dip out. In this war zone, I dipped in in 2012 and I got to know people very well and back in 2013 and back in 2014 it's a different situation completely because it's really a tragic situation it's really terrible because I've I got to know so many people I've got to know the doctors the the, the civilians I, I've treated so many people out there and I it's just 
I go backwards and forwards. I'm constantly on the telephone listening to see what's happening. I'm constantly getting reports back from the doctors there about how do I manage this patient, David? How do I manage that patient? You know, two or three times a week, I'm, I'm giving them advice uh, and so on. So I'm really with them on this one. I'm really in there with them. And to see them suffering so badly and to see everybody suffering so badly is really, really heartbreaking. And th these are doctors who could have presumably chosen to leave, but they chose to stay and obviously many have lost their lives. I, I said, I think in a report, 2014, that these doctors will stay until they'll die. And I have a terrible suspicion, you know, I, because I can't get through to them, perhaps they are dying. And, you know, we've done our best for them. We've, we've shown them how to operate. We've shown them how to treat their terrible cases. We've really done well from Siri Relief, which is the charity I worked for, a British charity, has done remarkably to try and uh, send so much aid to help everybody there. Remarkable. And it just seems to be so a, a real travesty that, that, that you know, this has just gone so badly, badly wrong.